Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I want to show you guys how we can make a floating callout title inside of DaVinci Resolve 16. So what we're going to do is build the callout directly on top of our video clip so that it's really easy to point the callout towards the item on the screen that we want to actually call out and track that around during the video clip. So that means we're going to just take the video clip and go straight over onto the Fusion page. So the Fusion is in the middle at the bottom with a little magic wand. So once we're here, we're going to get started by adding in some 3D objects. We're going to start with a shape 3D up here in the toolbar. Uh, we're also going to need a text 3D. And for this specific example, we're going to use two 3D renderers, uh, one for the handle shapes and then one for the text 3D shapes. And by rendering them separately, it will conveniently allow us to mask them independently of each other. So I'm going to take the 3D shape up here and we can actually make a merge node because eventually we're going to end up with more shapes and we'll do the same thing with the text 3D node and then with those individual merges have them selected individually with the left click and then click on the one at the end of the toolbar the renderer 3D and one for the text as well. And then before the final output for this node composition, we're just going to merge these with the original video clip. So I'm going to right click, do add tool, go down to composite and merge. We're going to want the media end to be the background. So make sure you connect media end to the yellow pen. And we can also merge these two together before we do the final merge. So I'll do composite and merge and just take these and connect them in there. The order shouldn't particularly matter at this point and then we'll make this merge the foreground for the final merge and then that becomes our media out so basically we're going to have some stuff happening with text render that merge that together with some stuff that's happening in shape 3d and then all of that gets merged with the original video clip so next let's work on the 3d shapes rather than have a plane as the default shape i'm going to take the shape and actually change that from plane to cylinder uh, cylinder as a shape will just look a little nicer, allowing the top and bottom to show a little bit of a curve at the ends. So the cylinder is clearly way too big for the screen right now, so I'll go over to the Transform tab for the 3D shape, and let's just change the scale. So I'll take the scale and decrease that uh, until it fits the screen a lot nicer. And then once we have it at a reasonable size, we can go back over to the Shape tab, and we can change the radius and the height in order to get the shape of the cylinder to fit more what we're looking for. So I'll take the radius and I'll decrease that so it is a lot thinner. And at this point we have a 3D object which kind of displays as a nice vertical bar that kind of has some curve at the end rather than being a very boxy square. We may also want to shrink the height a little bit just to make this a little smaller. And then we can go back over to the transform tab in order to position where we're going to want the call out to be. So I'll put it right around here and the callout will point to this uh, center area on this loop. So let's increase the vertical position as well. And I think that should look pretty good. And we'll have the little callout handle be from here to the center area inside of the loop. So now what we can do to save some time is just to copy this shape and then reposition it. So I'm going to take the shape 3D and do Control C, Control V to paste it. I'll link that to the merge 3D node. And now we have two shapes on screen. Uh, for each of these nodes, if you want it to make more sense to you, you can rename them. So I'll take the bottom node and and I'll call this the static callout shape. And for the top one, I'll call this the pointer shape, since the position of this one will change a little bit. So now we're going to want to make some adjustments to the pointer shape, which you really can't tell is there since it lines up perfectly with the original shape right now. So with pointer shape, I'm going to click on the little left preview circle so that it pops up here in 3D space. One thing you may notice is that the pivot is currently set to the center of the cylinder. So if we tried to rotate it, it would rotate around that center. But what we're actually going to want to do is make this pivot go to the top so that it will swing kind of like a door hinge. So let's go back over to the transform tab and let's expand the pivot. And we're going to need to adjust the pivot Y position until it comes up here to the top. Uh, we can also reset the translation X and Y to zero that'll make it easier to set the pivot temporarily so you can see it pops up there in the center so let's just adjust the pivot until it gets right into that top area so uh, for me right now that looks to be about 0 0.75 but that's of course going to depend on the height of your cylinder so just try to get it there so that whenever you rotate the uh, cylinder and I, I think we want z rotation 
Yep, there we go. It's going to swing like a door hinge, which will make it much easier to track where it's going to keep pointing to uh, as the shot moves around. So now let's adjust the starting position of that cylinder. I'll move this out of the way. Make sure that you are at frame zero so that we can set that up properly. And let's adjust the position of this handle. So let's take the Y and bring that down. The X, bring that over here so that it is basically right on top of the original one. And let's rotate the Z in order to point it where we need it to be for this callout. If we need, we can also go back over to the shape tab and expand the height a little bit and then adjust the X position to just make sure that everything's linked on top of everything properly. And at this point, it's probably a good time to keyframe the values that uh, may change a little bit during our shot. So I'm just going to set a keyframe for X, Y translation and more importantly, the Z rotation. OK, so now what we can do is go to the end of our shot or basically the last frame where we want this call out to still be in effect and to set the rotation so that it is still centered properly. So at frame zero, I'm going to point it towards that center area. And then at the final frame, I'm going to bring it down a little bit so that it's going to animate a little bit over time. We may also want to shrink the Y size here. So I'm going to uh, unlock the scale for each of the properties X, Y, Z. And I'll copy the X scale for Y and Z as well so that it looks like it did before. But let's go to frame zero, set a keyframe for the Y. But at the final frame, we may want to shrink this Y scale. And you can see that because the pivot is basically at the top, uh, this will make it pretty easy to just kind of shrink this pointer area. Uh, you can see that the pivot's not perfectly set, but um, if you need to adjust it, you can always go back and change it a little bit. If you need to make adjustments for the pivot, you still can. It's just playing with the numbers a little bit here. Um, but so far it looks pretty good. So maybe I'll adjust the Y position just a tad. And let's compare frame zero to the final frame. Maybe the Y position can drop a little bit on frame zero. But aside from that, it looks like those two are synced up pretty well. So if we hit play now, uh, what you should be able to see is that the uh, pointer handle is going to track that center area pretty well, which is probably what you're going to want with a moving shot like this. So, so far that's looking pretty good. And now to further indicate that this is the thing we're talking about, the center area here, we can also add an extra shape um, and we'll have that be at the same positions as, uh, we can also add another shape. So we'll just add a circle basically right on top of here or in 3D or for a 3D shape, that would be a sphere. So I'm going to click to add a shape. I'll call this pointer sphere with a F2 rename. And we'll change the shape to a sphere. And we will connect this to the merge. And it should show up on the screen. Let's shrink down the radius by a lot. Uh, basically, whatever size you feel comfortable with. We'll go to frame zero and position it right on top of the end of that handle. Keyframe the position. And we'll go back to frame 360. And we'll basically just adjust it there. Uh, because we keyframed the first frame, Adjusting the values here will create a new keyframe. And uh, just like that, the circle will basically be where we need it to be as well. We don't really need to worry about rotation like with the handle itself because the circle is basically staying static aside from its position. OK, so now if we want to finish up with this part of the callout title, uh, we can create a mask in order to have all of these parts uh, fade in over time during the first few frames of uh, this video clip. So we can create a mask really easily by going to right click, add tool, go down to mask. And uh, we have a bunch of options here, but rectangle is probably the most simple. So the idea of the rectangle is that anything inside of the rectangle will be visible and anything outside of the rectangle will be invisible. So if we want to create some animation, we just need to adjust the position or the size of the mask rectangle. Now uh, that won't show up until we actually connect it to the vendor 3D. So connect it to the blue pin there and you should see anything outside of the rectangle become invisible. You may also want to add in some soft edge in order to make it uh, kind of blur as it's fading in, uh, which might make it look a little bit more smooth. So let's uh, adjust the starting position and size for this rectangle. You can have it come from any direction you want, really. So let's, let's make it come from below. And we will keyframe the center X position. We'll go to the frame where we want the animation to end. Let's say frame 15. 
So if you're doing 30 frames per second, this will take half a second. And let's adjust it to basically fit the screen there. I will also increase the width and the height to make sure it can fit everything. And now if we go back to frame zero and hit play. Oh, okay. It looks like I, I set the keyframe at the wrong position. So I'm going to hit next to go to this 230 keyframe and click to remove that. Make sure you're at frame zero and then adjust the position of your Y or X center point. And uh, as long as there's just two keyframes, one at zero and one at 15, you should get an animation that looks something like this. Okay, so that looks decent. I'm going to decrease the soft edge a little bit. That's a little bit too much blur for me. And uh, that looks quite nice now. So we can also go to the end of our clip and set some final keyframes for a fade out effect as well. So I'll do the same thing, basically fading out to the top of the screen. So at frame 344 here, I'm setting a keyframe and then we go to the final frame and uh, adjust the Y position to be where we want it to end at and then hit play to check and see if that all works well. Okay, so at this point, we pretty much have the handles and the pointer sphere finished. So I'm just going to select all these nodes and kind of pull them aside so that we can uh, go back to the text 3D and start working on that. So, so obviously we're going to want to type some text in. So we can say call out if we want. Um, that text is clearly too big, so we can drop the size down a bit. I'm also going to recommend that you anchor it to the left so that when we make multiple text elements, uh, they can all be synced up with each other on the left side. Then go over to the translation tab and put the text where you need it to be. So let's put it right around there. If you want to change the font, uh, you're welcome to do so. And if you want a second text element, you can just copy the first one with control C, control V, and then put that into the merge node that feeds into your text renderer. Um, I'll go ahead and rename all of these. So the top text will be called top text. The bottom text will obviously be called bottom text. And I'll call the renderer text renderer. And up here, I'll rename this to the handle renderer for those shapes we created before. And uh, by doing a little bit of that, it should make it more clear what all of our things are doing. So now with this bottom text, I'll adjust the position, decreasing the Y position here. And we can also make it a little bit smaller so that the top element is more focused than the bottom. And uh, you can see though that when we have the horizontal left anchor, uh, that the scaling is basically stretching out from the left side to the right. So it's going to keep lining up with that top text, which is nice. Uh, for the bottom text, uh, let's go ahead and change the font. I'll make it one called Ink Free. And I'll make the bottom text Tutorial. So now if we play it back, we have something like this. Now uh, we could do the same animations that we did with the uh, handlebars with the text, but I think it would be more fun to actually make it a separate animation. So what we can do is go to frame 15 where we want the animation to end. And then for both the top text and the bottom text, go over to the third tab, Transform, and keyframe the spacing. So I do that for the bottom text as well. And then let's go to frame zero. And what we'll do with the spacing is we'll set it to zero and then do the same with the bottom text. And what this will make happen is that the text will be in reverse initially and very spaced out. But then over the course of those 15 frames, it will slide back into the place you would have expected. So if we hit play, it rotates into the position where we want it to be. And combined with the mask fade we created before, it ends up looking pretty cool in my opinion. And so what we can do if we want it to not be visible at frame zero, but take a few frames to actually fade in is go over to the shading tab and there'll be settings to play around with the color here. So if we take all of the values of red, green, blue, and alpha to zero, it will start at an invisible black and then we can fade that into a fully visible white over the same duration or maybe just five frames or so. So I'm going to take all of the values here and set them to zero at frame zero, keyframe them. Uh, find where we want them to be visible. Let's say frame 5 and then adjust them all back to uh, 1.0 for their value. So now if we go to frame 0, we get a nice fade effect on that text as it animates and that makes it look even smoother. So we can just repeat the same thing with the top text. So select the top text, go to shading, crank all the values down to 0, keyframe it, go to frame 5 and then adjust the values to 1.0. 
And then that gives us this, which looks pretty nice. So uh, we can also do the same. So we might also want to copy that effect to the end of our title. So I'll go over here to, mm, let's say frame, let's just do it at frame 345 here where the fading starts with the handles and we'll fade it out for the callout text as well. Um, but for the final fade out animation, we'll only play with the alpha and the color. We won't do the trick with the character spacing. So I'm going to set keyframes here for both top and bottom text. And then for five frames in the future, I will uh, fade those out to zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, preview this now. So we have our call out there and we're proceeding to the ending keyframes. And the text is gonna fade out along with the handlebars. Now, um, you might find that the text fading out faster than the handlebars is not what you want. So you can easily adjust the keyframes for any of the elements and any of the animations by opening up the keyframes window in the top right hand. And uh, if you drag this up, you'll be able to see all of the animations you've been setting. So we would want to look at the top text and the bottom text if we want to adjust these keyframes. Uh, look at the end, you can hold control middle mouse wheel in order to zoom in. And we can just select all four of these keyframes here for the top text and adjust the position to make it take a little longer for them to fade out. So if we do that for the bottom text as well, we can basically have that adjusted to be a longer animation very, very easily. So that's a really cool window you can use for this kind of thing. So let's play it back one more time. And uh, it looks now like the um, fading out is a little bit more in sync with each other. So I think that looks better. And of course we have the starting animation. Note that the handle is tracking that center area for this entire call out. So you're never really confused about what it's pointing to uh, because we spent that time to track it with the position and the rotation on that pointer handle. And then as we get to the end, we're going to get that simple fade out animation. And that basically gives us a pretty solid floating call out title made from scratch. Now, if you want to reuse this effect in the future for another project, you can simply select all of the nodes, right click on one of the nodes while you have everything selected, go to settings and then save as. Put this somewhere on your computer, call out resolve 16.setting or the dot settings automatic. So we'll just hit save there. And now you can bring that into any other project to basically reuse this node setup. So basically to reuse a setting, you can just drag it into the node editor for any clip in the fusion tab and bam, you get all of the same nodes. So that's basically how you copy your effect to other projects. So that's pretty much going to be it for this tutorial on creating a custom floating callout in DaVinci Resolve. I've been Chris, thanks for watching, and I will see you guys in my future video content.